The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Burke Asenwein. Chapter 25 Influencing the Crowd. Success in business, in the last analysis, turns upon touching the imagination of crowds. The reason that preachers in this present generation are less successful in getting people to want goodness than businessmen are in getting them to want motor cars, hats, and pianolas is that businessmen as a class are more close and desperate students of human nature and have boned down harder to the art of touching the imaginations of the crowds. Gerald Stanley Lee, Crowds in the early part of July 1914, a collection of Frenchmen in Paris or Germans in Berlin was not a crowd in a psychological sense. Each individual had his own special interests and needs, and there was no powerful common idea to unify them. A group then represented only a collection of individuals. A month later, any collection of Frenchmen or Germans formed a crowd, Patriotism, hate, a common fear, a pervasive grief, had unified the individuals. The psychology of the crowd is far different from the psychology of the personal members that compose it. The crowd is a distinct entity. Individuals restrain and subdue many of their impulses at the dictates of reason. The crowd never reasons, it only feels. As persons, there is a sense of responsibility attached to our actions, which checks many of our incitements, but the sense of responsibility is lost in the crowd because of its numbers. The crowd is exceedingly suggestible and will act upon the wildest and most extreme ideas. The crowd mind is primitive and will cheer plans and perform actions which its members would utterly repudiate. A mob is only a highly wrought crowd. Ruskin's description is fitting. You can talk a mob into anything. Its feelings may be, usually are, on the whole generous and right, but it has no foundation for them, no hold of them. You may tease or tickle it into anything at your pleasure. It thinks by infection, for the most part, catching an opinion like a cold, and there is nothing so little that it will not roar itself wild about when the fit is on, nothing so great, but it will forget in an hour when the fit is past. History will show us how the crowd mind works. The medieval mind was not given to reasoning, the medieval man attached great weight to the utterance of authority, his religion touched chiefly the emotions. These conditions provided a rich soil for the propagation of the crowd mind when in the 11th century flagellation, a voluntary self-scourging, was preached by the monks. Substituting flagellation for reciting penitential psalms was advocated by the reformers. A scale was drawn up, making 1,000 strokes equivalent to 10 psalms, or 15,000 to the entire psalter. This craze spread by leaps and crowds. Flagellant fraternities sprang up. Priests carrying banners led through the streets great processions reciting prayers and whipping their bloody bodies with leaden thongs fitted with four iron points. Pope Clement denounced this practice, and several of the leaders of those processions had to be burned at the stake before the frenzy could be uprooted. All Western and Central Europe was turned into a crowd by the preaching of the Crusaders, and millions of the followers of the Prince of Peace rushed to the Holy Land to kill the heathen. Even the children started on a crusade against the Saracens. The mob spirit was so strong that home affections and persuasion could not prevail against it, and thousands of mere babes died in their attempts to reach and redeem the sacred sepulchre. In the early part of the 18th century, the South Sea Company was formed in England. Britain became a speculative crowd. Stock in the South Sea Company rose from 128 one half points in January to 550 in May and scored 1,000 in July. Five million shares were sold at this premium. 
speculation ran riot hundreds of companies were organized one was formed for a wheel of perpetual motion another never troubled to give any reason at all for taking the cash of its subscribers it merely announced that it was organized for a design which will hereafter be promulgated owners began to sell the mob caught the suggestion a panic ensued the south sea company stock fell eight hundred points in a few days and more than a billion dollars evaporated in this era of frenzied speculation the burning of the witches at salem the klondike gold craze and the forty-eight people who were killed by mobs in the united states in nineteen thirteen are examples familiar to us in america the crowd must have a leader the leader of the crowd or mob is its determining factor he becomes self-hypnotized with the idea that unifies its members his enthusiasm is contagious and so is theirs the crowd acts as he suggests the great mass of people do not have any very sharply drawn conclusions on any subject outside of their own little spheres but when they become a crowd they are perfectly willing to accept ready-made hand-me-down opinions they will follow a leader at all costs in labor troubles they often follow a leader in preference to obeying their government in war they will throw self-preservation to the bushes and follow a leader in the face of guns that fire fourteen times a second the mob becomes shorn of will-power and blindly obedient to its dictator the russian government recognizing the menace of the crowd mind to its autocracy formally prohibited public gatherings history is full of similar instances how the crowd is created today the crowd is as real a factor in our socialized life as our magnates and monopolies it is too complex a problem merely to damn or praise it it must be reckoned with and mastered the present problem is how to get the most and the best out of the crowd spirit and the public speaker finds this to be peculiarly his own question his influence is multiplied if he can only transmute his audience into a crowd his affirmations must be their conclusions this can be accomplished by unifying the minds and needs of the audience and arousing their emotions their feelings not their reason must be played upon it is up to him to do this nobly argument has its place on the platform but even its potencies must subserve the speaker's plan of attack to win possession of his audience Reread the chapter on feeling and enthusiasm. It is impossible to make an audience a crowd without appealing to their emotions. Can you imagine the average group becoming a crowd while hearing a lecture on dry fly fishing or on Egyptian art? On the other hand, it would not have required world famous eloquence to have turned any audience in Ulster in 1914 into a crowd by discussing the Home Rule Act. The crowd spirit depends largely on the subject used to fuse their individualities into one glowing whole. Note how Antony played upon the feelings of his hearers in the famous funeral oration given by Shakespeare in Julius Caesar. From murmuring units, the men became a unit, a mob. Antony's oration over Caesar's body friends romans countrymen lend me your ears i come to bury caesar not to praise him the evil that men do lives after them the good is oft interred with their bones so let it be with caesar the noble brutus hath told you caesar was ambitious if it were so it was a grievous fault and grievously hath caesar answered it here under leave of brutus and the rest for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransom did the general coffers fill. 
did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept, ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that, on the Lupercal, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Weeps First Plebeian Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. Second Plebeian If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Third Plebeian Has he, masters? I fear there will a worse come in his place. Fourth Plebeian Mark ye his words, he would not take the crown, therefore tis certain he was not ambitious. First Plebeian If it be found so, some will dear abide it. Second Plebeian Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. Third plebeian. There is not a nobler man in Rome than Anthony. Fourth plebeian. Now mark him, he begins again to speak. Anthony. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. O oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who, you all know, are honourable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honourable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read, and they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds, and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and, dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. Fourth Plebeian. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. All. The will, the will, we will hear Caesar's will. Antony. Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs, for if you should, oh, what would come of it? fourth plebeian read the will we'll hear it antony you shall read us the will caesar's will antony will you be patient will you stay a while i have overshot myself to tell you of it i fear i wrong the honourable men whose daggers have stabbed caesar i do fear it fourth plebeian they were traitors <laughs> honourable men all the will, the testament. Second plebeian. They were villains, murderers. The will, read the will. Antony. You will compel me then to read the will? Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend, and will you give me leave? All. Come down. Second plebeian. Descend. He comes down from the rostrum. Third plebeian. You shall have leave. Fourth plebeian. A ring. Stand round. First plebeian. Stand from the hearse. Stand from the body. Second plebeian. Room for Antony. Most noble Antony. Antony. 
Nay, press not so upon me, stand far off. All. Stand back, room, bear back. Antony. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. Twas on a summer's evening, in his tent, that day he overcame the nervy. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked. Or no, for Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh you gods, how Caesar loved him. This was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, ingratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen! Then I and you and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and I perceive you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded? Look you here, he is himself, marred, as you see, by traitors. First plebeian, O oh, piteous spectacle! Second plebeian, O oh, noble Caesar! Third plebeian, O oh, woeful day! Fourth plebeian, O oh, traitors, villains! First plebeian, O oh, most bloody sight! Second plebeian, We will be revenged! All, revenge, about, seek, burn, fire, kill, day, let not a traitor live. Antony, stay, countrymen. First plebeian, peace there, hear the noble Antony. Second plebeian, we'll hear him, we'll follow him, we'll die with him. Antony, good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny, they that have done this deed are honourable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honourable, and will, no doubt, with reasons, answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is. But as you know me all, a plain, blunt man, that love my friend, and that they know full well, that gave me public leave to speak of him, for I have neither wit nor worth, action or utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show your sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. All. Will mutiny. First plebeian. Will burn the house of Brutus. Third plebeian. Away then, come seek the conspirators. Antony. Yet hear me, countrymen, yet hear me speak all peace ho hear antony most noble antony antony why friends you go to do you know not what wherein hath caesar thus deserved your loves alas you know not i must tell you then you have forgot the will i told you of plebeians most true the will let's stay and hear the will Antony, here is the will, and under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several men, seventy-five drachmas. Second plebeian, most noble Caesar, will revenge his death. 
third plebeian. O royal Caesar! Antony, hear me with patience. All. Peace, ho! Antony, moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private arbors, and new planted orchards, on this side Tiber. He hath left them you, and to your heirs forever, common pleasures, to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? First plebeian. Never, never. Come away, away. We'll burn his body in the holy place, and with the bronze fire the traitor's houses. Take up the body. Second plebeian. Go, fetch fire. Third plebeian. Pluck down benches. Third plebeian. Pluck down benches. Fourth plebeian. Pluck down forms, windows, anything. Excellent citizens with the body. Antony. Now let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what curse thou wilt. To unify single auditors into a crowd, express their common needs, aspirations, dangers, and emotions, deliver your message so that the interests of one shall appear to be the interests of all. The conviction of one man is intensified in proportion as he finds others sharing his belief and feeling. Antony does not stop with telling the Roman populace that Caesar fell, he makes the tragedy universal. Then I and you and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Applause, generally a sign of feeling, helps to unify an audience. The nature of the crowd is illustrated by the contagion of applause. Recently a throng in a New York moving picture and vaudeville house had been applauding several songs, and when an advertisement for tailored skirts was thrown on the screen, someone started the applause, and the crowd, like sheep, blindly imitated, until someone saw the joke and laughed. Then the crowd again followed the leader and laughed at and applauded its own stupidity. Actors sometimes start applause for their lines by snapping their fingers. Someone in the first few rows will mistake it for faint applause, and the whole theatre will chime in. An observant auditor will be interested in noticing the various devices a monologist will use to get the first round of laughter and applause. He works so hard because he knows an audience of units is an audience of indifferent critics, but once get them to laughing together, and each single laughter sweeps a number of others with them, until the whole theatre is a roar and the entertainer has scored. These are meretricious schemes, to be sure, and do not savour in the least of inspiration, but crowds have not changed in their nature in a thousand years, and the one law holds for the greatest preacher and the pettiest stump speaker. You must fuse your audience, or they will not warm to your message. The devices of the great orator may not be so obvious as those of the vaudeville monologist, but the principle is the same. He tries to strike some universal note that will have all his hearers feeling alike at the same time. The evangelist knows this when he has the soloist sing some touching song just before the address. Or he will have the entire congregation sing, and that is the psychology of now everybody sing, for he knows that they who will not join in the song are as yet outside the crowd. Many a time has the popular evangelist stopped in the middle of his talk, when he felt that his hearers were units instead of a molten mass, and a sensitive speaker can feel that condition most depressingly, and suddenly demanded that everyone arise and sing, or repeat aloud a familiar passage, or read in unison, or perhaps he has subtly left the thread of his discourse to tell a story that, from long experience, he knew would not fail to bring his hearers to a common feeling. These things are important resources for the speaker, and happy is he who uses them worthily and not as a despicable charlatan. 
the difference between a demagogue and a leader is not so much a matter of method as of principle even the most dignified speaker must recognize the eternal laws of human nature you are by no means urged to become a trickster on the platform far from it but don't kill your speech with dignity to be icily correct is as silly as to rant do neither but appeal to those world-old elements in your audience that have been recognized by all great speakers from demosthenes to sam small and see to it that you never debase your powers by arousing your hearers unworthily it is as hard to kindle enthusiasm in a scattered audience as to build a fire with scattered sticks an audience to be converted into a crowd must be made to appear as a crowd this cannot be done when they are widely scattered over a large seating space or when many empty benches separate the speaker from his hearers have your audience seated compactly how many a preacher has bemoaned the enormous edifice over which what would normally be a large congregation has scattered in chilled and chilling solitude sunday after sunday bishop brooks himself could not have inspired a congregation of one thousand souls seated in the vastness of st peter's at rome in that colossal sanctuary it is only on great occasions which bring out the multitudes that the service is before the high altar at other times the smaller side chapels are used universal ideas surcharged with feeling help to create the crowd atmosphere examples liberty character righteousness courage fraternity altruism country and national heroes George Cohen was making psychology practical and profitable when he introduced the flag and flag songs into his musical comedies. Cromwell's regiments prayed before the battle and went into the fight singing hymns. The French corps, singing the Marseillaise in 1914, charged the Germans as one man. Such unifying devices arouse the feelings, make soldiers fanatical mobs, and, alas, more efficient murderers. End of section 25